another form of the nine goddess is goddess saraswati who symbolizes wisdom when it comes to wisdom and knowledge how can the woman flourished with knowledge and clarity of thoughts be excluded from it and b news 24 is featuring such women who fit the saying beauty with brains week and we are featuring women from various fields and after today we are at Simbiosis Law School Pune which is one of the top 10 law colleges in Pune and Goddess Saraswati resembles uh, education, resembles uh, wisdom and today we have uh, a similar lady with us Dr. Shashikala Gurpur who is the director of Simbiosis Law School Pune and uh, she is a lady who loves to bring smiles to people and who believes in learning so we have uh, such an inspiring lady with us who will be talking to us later hello uh, please tell us about your journey of to becoming director of such a reputed college and how, how did you pursue your journey thank you for the question first of all uh, two things i must specify that sir so the follows lakshmi navratri Uh, but uh, in real life, Saraswati and Lakshmi can be together, although reconciliation is difficult. But symbiosis and symbiosis law school in particular, under the visionary leadership of Dr. Zulad, Dr. Vidya, and our Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Gupte, is uh, a rare example of how Lakshmi and Saraswati can coexist. Uh, so, with good cooperation of Saraswati, Lakshmi can be staying, otherwise, she is supposed to be fickle minded. But uh, Lakshmi without Saraswati also can be quite uh, unreasonably dictating you. So there is a good combination of the two in any endeavor which is based on highly ethical, highly efficient kind of institution. My vision. Uh, my journey to symbiosis is a matter of pleasant uh, coincidence. It's a series of coincidences. First of all, my entry to law itself is a very strange, uh, fate-driven. Uh, Uh, you can say compulsion uh, quickly if i have to sum up the circumstances i grew up in a village near mangalore which is on the west coast of karnataka speaking tulu at home kannada in school uh, till my 10th standard it was all kannada medium school government school and uh, primary school was again kannada medium but it had uh, what you call as foundational education of gandhi so and there were very strong values ingrained very close life with nature uh, after i finished my 10th i had to come to mangalore because there was no college in the village and um, my parents aim was that i study with the best of the uh, community which is in the leading uh, college run by christian missionaries st agnes college because i was one of the top merit students in 10th uh, it was a logical conclusion that i took science and in science i excelled and i was one of the toppers in the university so the automatic choice when you top in biological sciences is medicine so after 12th also i had the option after degree also i had the option but the circumstances were such that my father was very sick and i was a first child my mother was a very homely conventional kind of woman so conservative so i had to uh, investigate into the causes of my father's stress which was because of lot of properties which were mired in litigation so i decided to do law and then to negotiate better with the system and that worked i entered the law school uh, partly out of commitment to family partly out of reluctance to leave science although i had a scholarship to jnu to indian institute of science but uh, first year i was never happy with the law school then i slowly got the cajoles of student politics networking court systems understanding solving litigation uh, identifying cost benefit analysis about litigation so i decided that our family co- uh, litigations must be settled out of court if we want a more quality life by the time i figured it out i was in final year llb 50% of the disputes we had solved out of court another 50% could resolve by that time my father died so i decided to go for higher studies in mysore it was not easy to get into higher studies so i was given the option of international law which at that time i was unhappy because my aim was to practice in the high court and later to enter judiciary or i is but uh, because it was international law i was forced to look into the international policy etc today i see in symbiosis with its internationalization core it's the most relevant discipline and it is the way the 
nation is going and the world is going. So after my degree, I went back to Mangalore, started teaching. So Dr. Menon uh, invited me to seminars in National Law School in the second year of my service. And then uh, it was history, like he invited me to join the National Law School. I met uh, my future husband there who was a Irish law professor who had come on a Rotary Fellowship. I married him, I went to Ireland. In mid-90s, I was exposed to what is still to be reality in India, to the best standards of higher education and legal education. And after three years there, I had to come back due to family reasons. I came back with my son. Then for three years, I created my own NGO and I was working with the community. I was trying to uh, implement the finest human rights ideas in the context of women in our coastal city. So about 45 cases I handled of domestic violence and various... Uh, uh, yes, so talking about women, today mm -hmm. women are very reluctant to, you know, to come out or step out of their mm -hmm. homes and share their problems, yeah. like the increasing women atrocities. Mm -hmm. So regarding that, what should they do? What, how should they be... Yeah, in my NGO experience of three years, uh, which later translated into student researches and articles and all, and thereafter I went to Manipal. From Manipal I got an opportunity to take up a corporate job in Abu Dhabi, where again gender issues were very, very strongly uh, coming out as the challenges to equality in workplace and economic justice. And uh, 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 it is there that I met Dr. R.G. Verodikar, our uh, Dean from Health Sciences and Managing Committee member, uh, incidentally Dr. Vidya's husband as well. He uh, had met me for internship context in that corporate uh, where I was working, which is a multinational health conglomerate. And then he handed out his card. I never thought I'll come back to India. But suddenly I had to come back and the only place I sent my CV was symbiosis. Somehow looking at Dr. Rajiv's humility, his professionalism, in those two hours I got highly attracted to uh, the organization where he was somebody. And then um, at that time the sitting principal here had to leave due to some reasons. So Dr. Mzumdar uh, co-opted my CV and I never looked back. 2007 I joined here. Now entire journey of mine in my NGO work prior to that as a law teacher is to do personal legal aid clinic in the village. Mm -hmm. I realized that women on their own don't come out for many reasons. Mm -hmm. First reason is they feel uh, whether it is bad family, ill-treating family, it's okay I have a safe home. If I come out I don't know where I go. So I'll be more vulnerable, there will be more risks. Second, there may be children and she feels that if she is out of the house with the children, even children will feel socially ostracized. Third, she feels that nobody wants her sob story. Nobody wants to have this depressed story. Everyone wants to watch good things good on stories. media. They want good stories, they want pleasure. Okay. So she becomes a burden. It tires people, she fatigues people. So finally she decides to uh, get on with the same uh, quality less painful life. Uh, my suggestion is coming out is not without challenges but staying in has more consequences for the mental health of the children, for uh, economic development. So you have to somehow, uh, how you decide the situation. We have had cases where we have kept the women in the same house but we have made men to be brought to the police. Uh, put under force. Sometimes we have put to men to counsel men. So each situation is different. Mm -hmm. You can create a solution whereby both men and women can lead a dignified life under the same roof or they can be separated but they can look after the common grounds of welfare of children, future planning for the children. Mm -hmm. Third could be that when you become good individuals, your relationship becomes good. This is something that people don't realize. Exactly. There is a Nobel laureate called Nash. He has done an extensive study on how economics plays a very important role in terms of uh, well-being in the family. So by economics, he doesn't mean only economic assets like salary and property. What he means is even individual growth, you know. So when women are facing atrocity, it's because that woman's worth, that woman's dignity as an individual is not respected by the other person because of some strong belief systems and wrong notions. And also those belief systems making them believe that this woman should be, she is my servant, she is supposed to serve me, she doesn't have her own needs, her whole life's meaningfulness is in being a wife or the mother or the daughter in catering to the needs of the males in the family. Question. Does this mean that, you know, the women are, uh, you know, somewhere in, in the fault in this? That I feel women are not in fault, they are in ignorance because 
yesterday I was reading a very good piece in the Outlook magazine. They were talking about how predatory women in powerful positions, women in powerful positions turn to be predatory to younger, minor men or other women. Uh, they may become more like male models of authority and hierarchy. This is because patriarchy as a thought process gives you the idea that if you want to be seen as a powerful person, you have to raise your voice, you have to be masculine, you have to be muscular, you have to assert power. So they were writing about how even women, when they are empowered also, they tend to mimic men. So these women, whether they are in powerful position or in uh, subordinate position, the whole thought process is dominated. You know, Gilligan, this famous uh, Carol Gilligan, famous feminist, talks about how, she talks about care ethics and uh, the ever male and female ethical approaches mm -hmm. with the game theory. And she talks about um, uh, how women have a different voice. Then Catherine McKeenan, the radical feminist, ask, asks a question, how her voice can be her voice when his foot is on her throat? So, how women can, be, I don't call women can be at fault, but women have the key to uh, come out of that situation. I've seen women asserting their rights in their own feminine, uh, superficially subordinate looking ways but exuding lot of power in dictating the situation and changing the situation if not for themselves but for their children but when they repress it and continue in that they become prey to arthritis they become prey to bad health obesity exactly. that's because they cannot have that internal space mm -hmm. to think about themselves that's why spirituality is very important, important. And uh, uh, also, like uh, being a lawyer, mm -hmm. we would like to also ask you about the recent judgments mm -hmm. by SC regarding four ni section 497 and mm -hmm. 377. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what are your views regarding that? Both the judgments are very welcome moves. Uh, Supreme Court has gone on uh, correcting the past, correcting the landscape of gender relationships in this country. Uh, both these judgments, especially the four, uh, 497 if we are talking about um, I feel that this kind of judgment will ensure gender equality because hitherto the very idea of equality was about status quo and not altering the status quo and not altering the identity of the victim or survivor so called survivor on the other hand in uh, 377 hitherto the notion was as if heterosexual dominant model of sexuality is the model and rest of them were seen as unhealthy, they were seen as sick, they were seen as not serving the function of the nature. It's not that in our country people made a big issue out of it, but, but in public discourse we had very strong views about it. Mm -hmm. So the court has altered this kind of uh, strong positions. I think uh, if society doesn't change on its own, yes. law reflecting that intention of the society, especially in our country now nearly 65% youth, who don't want to be fettered by these traditional notions, who are influenced by the things happening in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So court has to reflect to that social concern. So yes. that is what is exactly happening. Uh, if you see 497, court is dictating the change. Whereas in 377, court is reflecting the intention of the society to change. Mm -hmm. So law has to be sometimes initiator, law has to be sometimes indicator. Both exactly. roles has been played by Supreme Court. Yes, okay. and uh, also being a like director of mm -hmm. this huge institute, mm -hmm. how do you gel up with the students? How do you fill the generation gap between you and them? Very good question. The, you should see that the gap is erased by yourself. When you are in the company of the young, you always remain young. Uh, but there is also your biological clocks, uh, biological clock which is ticking and reminding you you are this, you are that, you grew up in this, your values are this. You have to come down from your uh, pedestal and think like the students whom you have a mission to uh, develop. I don't use the word groom because mm. it's a very value-loaded word. I would use the word you, uh, word. you have a responsibility to lovingly, kindly uh, develop them to be profound individuals who will withstand any kind of uncertainty in future. Uh, second is that you remain youthful by engaging in uh, constructive activities, by engaging in, uh, let us say, fine arts, by engaging in uh, current events, because the youth is ever vibrating with energy. And youthfulness is irrespective of biological age. Youthfulness is an attitude. Um, it's an approach to living. 
So as long as you have that youthfulness in you, irrespective of how the body reflects the aging or, or time's marks on your body, irrespective of that, if your inside world is like a child retaining that curiosity, innocence and uh, softness and gentleness, I'm sure that, I mean, which is ultimately called as, uh, what Buddha calls as loving kindness or, uh, you know, limitless compassion, uh, there is no gap, there is no bridging because it's Advaita of a new type, undivided kind of self, you know. Before your students stand up, you know what is bothering mm. them. I think that is the kind of ideal uh, leadership uh, position one should uh, have, otherwise in this profession, particularly education. Because I have taken education as the platform, as the means, not to just limit myself as a teacher and uh, administrative teacher, but to use education and what I learnt in this education to build those outside of the college also and to take students to the world outside the college also. So education should be only a means, it should not be limit. And I also feel, especially in justice education, mm -hmm. you are preparing the leaders of tomorrow because lawyers are, if you see law graduates have changed the destiny of communities and nations. Uh, Rotary was started by a lawyer, independence movement all over the world was dictated by lawyers or political thinkers. So law has a very close marriage with politics uh, and governance. Therefore, our role as teachers of law is uh, as teachers of uh, people who pulsate with the need of justice, the outcry for justice. So as a law teacher, uh, I have always maintained that kind of multiple roles of a law teacher. I feel there is no other, I agree with Dr. Uh, Madhav Menon, there is no other platform ideally set for a public intellectual than legal education and law teacher's role. Because a law teacher has to engage with the policy as expert, community as a healer, with your students as uh, somebody who guides them and gives them a vision and perspective about life, uh, with your colleagues as someone who constantly mentors them as a friend of judges who dictates the values and uh, nicely polishes. For example, I am engaged with National Judicial Academy. Uh, I give uh, training on things like how do you understand your relationship with the media. Uh, recently I was engaging judges in that kind of exercise. Or how do you look at social justice. These are my strong forte aside from my international law and gender engagement. So I engage with law commission in terms of how to reform the law. We engage with the bar in terms of bringing lawyers here or going to lawyers meetings and talking to them. We engage with the community through NGOs and our community legal service. So for a law teacher, sky is the limit to use education to reform the society. So yes. I feel that I am uh, very, very fortunate to, uh, to be a law teacher. As Dr. Menon says, I would also say, if I have another life, I will be born as a teacher and essentially as a law teacher because justice is uh, an unfinished project always. You know, it's, it's never complete and rule of law is a value which you cherish and uh, which you need to reinforce from time to time because society tends to forget. Because after all, it is an abstract concept. It's to make it lived reality or to make effort. So I feel you know, the mixing with students you can do uh, by being open to them. We conduct open houses. They even have the freedom to criticize and tell us where we are wrong mm -hmm. and their perception of how things have not been working for them. And then we take it seriously. We put it into action and then we give them action taken report. We have a student council which is 10% of the student body and they are working closely with us in better governance and better deliverance of service to the students of institute facilities. Students are there in virtually every academic community, in every academic committees. Uh, our focus on research and uh, law teaching and law practice uh, skills training, everywhere students are hand in hand with us. So unleashing the student potential of that big body was really a big boon to my teachers also. So I have never stopped teaching. I have never stopped entering the class. I wouldn't also. I wouldn't like to. And within the college I do that. Outside college I go to train the faculty. I go to train the researchers. So what's happening across India, outside India, I am very aware. So that awareness is also brought to my colleagues. They also are going and they bring their awareness. So it's a kind of collective, dynamic, ever-growing, ever-changing landscape because of which it becomes a constantly learning organization. Only a learning organization can renew itself 
and the people there can be happy and uh, contributing thank so you so that's much my humble suggestion you're such an inspiration to all out there so basically this is the week of navratri would you like to say something to the people out there yeah, to the women uh, out there yeah personally i follow navratri very closely as a vratam uh, in last i mean ever since i was born i was trained like that they say the nights all the nights are the nights when nature's energy is in a particular frequency so women folk must take some time out for themselves they don't take time out for themselves they are always surrounded by their uh, chores or their relatives or their children so just learn to take time out for yourself that absolutely quiet meditative time in the night at least for 10 to 15 minutes and feel the enormous power of goddess in you and uh, enormous multiple hands with which you multitask and realize how powerful you are and what your entitlements are and claim those entitlements by keeping that space for yourself and asserting your uh, total womanhood all the best and um, please understand that there is no peace without justice uh, so always uh, reflect on your situation negotiate constantly negotiate your individual space individual self and individual meaningfulness all the best thank you so much ma'am so we had a great talk with dr shashikala gurpur so thank you so much ma'am for you. your uh, encouraging words uh, i am ekhola mukherjee along with video journalist akash kharade npnews network pune thank you